All right, well, it's 12.03. Let's go ahead and uh, get the program started. Uh, I see that there are some other people logging on and they will be coming on through the program. Uh, we really appreciate everyone being here today for this important program. My name is Doug Silverstein and I'm the chair of the LACPA litigation section. Uh, it's our pleasure to bring you today's webinar on the first full day of summer. We so appreciate our partnership with the Los Angeles Superior Court. The court has worked incredibly hard to manage its operations during the pandemic and safely administer justice. The fast track personal injury bench trial program is the result of the court critically analyzing how it can best meet the needs of its users, litigants and counsel, and at the same time address the pandemic backlog of cases. With over 300 people registered for today's program, there is obviously great interest in this. I want to personally thank Danielle Jones at LACPA for handling all of the logistics of the program and all of today's judge and attorney panelists for the time they have spent preparing for today. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the program and you as the audience have the ability to ask questions by using the Q&A feature within the Zoom webinar. Please use that instead of the chat function. The court has an incredibly deep and talented bench with substantial familiarity and experience trying personal injury cases. And we are going to hear directly from some of those judges today about how the fast track personal injury bench trial program will work. Starting off today's program, we're going to hear a few words um, from the Los Angeles County Superior Court presiding judge, Eric Taylor. Judge Taylor has been a staunch supporter of the courts and access to justice. Judge Taylor. Greetings, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for being here and participating. I'm Judge Eric Taylor, presiding judge of Los Angeles County. I'm sorry I couldn't be here with you today, but honestly, who really is in person anymore? Welcome to our town hall on expedited bench trials and personal injury cases. This is an exciting step forward in our united effort to assure access to justice for so many in our community, so many of you and your clients. This is a true demonstration of how many divergent interests can come together for our community in our courts to move justice ahead, but consistent with pursuing your and your clients' interests in our profession. I'd like to personally thank our partners in this endeavor. First, the Los Angeles County Bar Association, for helping to arrange this session, specifically President Tamila Jensen and litigation chair Doug Silverstein, from ASCDC, Diana Lytell, and Marta Alkenbach, from Oboda, Mike Schoenbach, from Cala, Jeannie Harrison, and for our dear friends at the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, President Linda Spiegel and Beverly Hills Bar Association President Adam Siegler. Without you, this would not be possible. I'd also like to give a special shout out to our team inside the court. One of the best things that I ever did as presiding judge was to create the special working group on civil jury trials, chaired by civil supervising judge David Cowan, along with judges Williams Court, Jones, Kendig, Crowley, Maloney, Ollendorf, Liu, Morales, Rice, Judge Ford, Ruth Kwan, and Joel Lofton. This wonderful idea came from you after considering input from our many bar leaders and justice partners. Thank you again for being a team member in innovation. Now, my friend and colleague, Judge David Cowan. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the supervising judge of civil, David Cowan, who of course sits in department one. Uh, David is absolutely committed to the safe and effective reopening of the civil courts. And I've been privileged to work with him extensively. I've seen firsthand how much he cares and I'm really honored to call him a friend. Um, you may not know this, but a few years ago, Judge Cowan was injured in a hit and run while riding his bicycle. And a driver who saw it followed the person who hit him and fled the scene and reported that driver to the police, which Judge Cowan only discovered after obtaining the police report. Thankfully, he has fully recovered when we're all the better for it. Judge Cowan. 
All right, thank you, Doug, and thank you for uh, all of our panelists today and for all of you uh, attending this program. Uh, as Doug has indicated, we have actually worked hard to try to come up with a, a program that could provide lawyers and your clients with uh, a quick way to hear um, an appropriate, for the court to hear an appropriate case in front of a judge. Uh, we recognize, as, as my colleagues are gonna indicate to you in a minute, that this is not for every case, but we purposely did not put limits on it um, and kept it uh, extremely broad in order for you all to determine yourselves which cases do or don't uh, meet needs of your clients to have one of these bench trials. So the absence of, again, of a restriction was, was purposeful. What I'd like to do in, in um, the few minutes I have this morning, and then again, I'll be available during the Q&A is to walk you through some of the logistics of the program. And then my colleagues uh, and, and counsel will indicate, you know, wh what type of case is this really, would this really be best for and the advantages in electing to use this program. The first thing I, I really like to do is actually, I have a lot to say about this, is that is and repeat what Judge Taylor indicated, that this really is a product of different bar groups coming together. I've had a number of conversations with the bar leadership and tr we've tried to tailor this so that it meets your, your needs as, as attorneys. And I particularly want to shout, give a shout out to Aboda uh, because um, as you all know, they are very committed to the importance as am I of our jury trial system. And this is obviously is a bench trial. And I was very pleased that they stood behind this program on a temporary basis as a way to help the court move through its, its volume of cases. Um, and, um, and we, again, designed this so that it's an election to a bench trial. Nobody at the court has any interest in depriving anybody of a jury trial. And so I think that's, that's important to state at the beginning. And during this pandemic, um, it's really come home to me in, in running civil that how critical the jury trial really is to our civil justice system. It, um, without those jury trials, the engine is, is stopped. And so uh, it's critical to me that as we move forward, we will uh, see more and more jury trials. But again, not every tri case has to be tried by a jury. Uh, and there are going to be a number of cases where your clients can receive full justice uh, in a quicker, cheaper way, and possibly remotely through a bench trial. And um, we'll talk about, again, those cases in a minute. Let me talk about, get into the nitty gritty of um, what the, how this works. I think the one big thing that is different that, that, that you're all used to is that it does not require a hearing in front of a judge to elect to use this program. All you need to do is go on the court's civil page website, civil page of the court's website and, put, and download and print out one of these forms, which is called an expedited PI trial court form. And for you and your co-counsel to sign off agreeing that you and your clients wish to uh, uh, use the program. No hearing is required. All you would do is submit the form electronically to the uh, email address, Department 1, indicated on the form, and the Department 1 staff will process it promptly. Uh, note uh, the critical issues, like number of parties, age of the case, length of the trial, any specific issues, and the department the case is currently assigned to. There is room on the form for making special requests or special considerations, perhaps the age, um, again, of some of the, one of the litigants, perhaps somebody's coming from out of town, difficulties with uh, a particular expert and his or her timing and availability, and so on. So the form is really very self-explanatory. Even during this uh, webinar now, I encourage you to download it from the court website, print it, pull it up, see if you have any questions, and we can perhaps answer those um, at the end of, um, of the session today. Again, you'll note in bold that by submitting this application, you are agreeing to waive your right to a jury trial, which is a condition precedent 
to participating in the program. The, um, the other important part of this is who's going to be trying your case. Um, the form indicates that the parties maintain all rights afforded by Code of Civil Procedure Section 170.6. In other words, uh, if uh, Department 1 notifies you uh, that you have Judge X and one or other of you choose to exercise a challenge, uh, you will have that ability to do so. And the case will then go to the next judge uh, that the Department 1 uh, can find from its roster of civil trial judges available to hear the, the, this case. Uh, Department 1 needs to um, keep the determination as to who the judge is going to be because not all judges are available at all times. They're trying other cases, uh, whether bench or jury trials, conducting settlement conferences. We even take vacation once in a while. So um, um, we will. that's why it's important that we note um, the length of the trial, uh, age of the case, whether the five-year date is approaching, uh, and, and and allow me to make sure we can get the right judge to you uh, who's available. Um, the court assures those who are electing to use this program that the trial will be within 60 days from when you submit the form. Uh, it could also be much sooner than that, depending on um, if you all agree to it and the judge is available. Approximately five days after you elect um, to, to choose the program and you're notified of the judge, the, the new judge will um, schedule a uh, trial settings co conference to discuss what particular day you would use. And that will be a firm, solid trial date. Again, we are assuring you that this will be, the trial will be within 60 days. Um, um, the, um, the, the court and our committee uh, chose 60 days for a reason. Uh, this allows sufficient time for you to um, uh, file the necessary motions that you might wish to bring pre-trial, different motions in limine that may be important to each of you. So again, there is time to do that and, and that is not being sacrificed. Uh, we do need you, however, to indicate that you are trial ready. Uh, and uh, there's no point in doing this if you are not ready. In other words, if the judge finds that you are not ready, you are gonna be the, no longer eligible to use this program and you will go back to the PI hub and be processed in due course. Uh, that's, that's the way this would work. And therefore, within five days of notification of the FSC date, we would expect that all trial documents uh, be submitted. For example, the um, uh, witness list, exhibit list, uh, and so on. Apparently, I'm already over, over um, my, my allotted time. Thank you, Doug. Um, and I'll come back to some of my other points to make sure that everybody gets to be heard today. I would just say, I'll finish on this final note, that this is going to be critical uh, going forward. Whatever the situation with social distancing may become, uh, however much we, we might hopefully soon get out of this pandemic, we've been in this situation for almost 18 months. It doesn't take rocket scientists to, to, to realize that we've got a lot of cases that did not get tried during that time. And so um, this case, this is going to be critical for the functioning of civil going forward and I really thank you for your consideration of finding that appropriate case. Back to you, Doug. Thanks so much, David. Really, really important points that you're making there, especially the importance of this program moving forward, even as things start to open up um, to help with the pandemic backlog, uh, because it's going to delay jury trials even further with, with the backlog right now. So uh, I'm sure you'll have a chance to share some additional thoughts during the Q&A, David. Uh, next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Judge Serena Murillo, uh, who is a PI hub judge in the Spring Street Courthouse. Um, she has a lot of civil experience when she was an attorney and she learned early on how to resolve disputes on the local basketball courts and ultimately played NCAA basketball. I've heard she has a silky smooth judge, uh, jump shot. Please welcome Judge Maria. Thank you. And thank you for that um, 
that's probably the best introduction I've ever gotten. So thank you, Doug. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my role here is hopefully to give you a little glimpse of what the world looks like from my vantage point sitting in the PI Hub, and I'm honored to represent my colleagues in the PI Hub to give you that glimpse. Um, having been a trial attorney myself, I probably think in analogies more than I should have, more than I should. So I'm gonna offer you a little analogy to explain to you what's happening in my little corner of the world. Um, the best way to describe it is that time that you went to the airport in order to hop on that flight and you think you have everything in order, you have your bags, your documents, your everything, you get to the gate and that, that airline employee tells you, oh, actually that's not the right ticket or you don't have your passport or you don't have whatever you need to get on this flight. Unfortunately, you can't get on this flight right now. And that unfortunate employee has the task of letting you know that you can go down to gate whatever and get on the next flight in a half hour or go down the other direction, there's another one in an hour. I feel like that unfortunate airline attendant. And obviously I'm not talking about flights, I'm talking about trials. Because when you come to me for uh, an FSC and I'm explaining to you a, a litany of things that could be uncertain in your travel future, if you miss that flight, the reality is I don't have another one in a half hour or even an hour. Um, depending on what court you're in, that next flight available might be, for instance, in my court, if it's a 2019 or 2020 case, we're looking at 2023. That's the backlog in my court as a result of COVID. And that's because those reservation slots, those additional flights that may have otherwise been available are not, they are jam packed. I have a finite number of jury trial slots that are available at the beginning of the week. And I look over it with my staff and I'm gonna tell you it's, it's a little stressful. Uh, my colleagues and I are rest assured doing everything that we can to ensure access to justice and get you to trial as soon as we possibly can, because we know that uncertainty causes tension and anxiety and you wanna get these issues resolved. I, I can relate and, and I understand that and, and I think all of us do. Um, but the reality is that I have a finite number of flights going out. So, so what happens? Um, there, the uncertainty that happens at my travel gate includes that maybe you haven't had an MSC in the last 90 days. Maybe, um, you know, with this five day trailing period that can happen, once I tell you what court you're going to, you have to wait five days to make sure. Sometimes it takes a while to find a trial court once I send you to department one. And in those five days, like a case I had today, that now pushes you into a time period when maybe one of the parties is going on vacation or maybe a witness is not gonna be available. Um, I know from having been a trial attorney, um, waiting for a trial is uncertain. It's stressful. It's stressful for you. It's stressful for the attorneys. It's stressful for, I'm sorry, for the clients. It's stressful for witnesses and people who might just be interested in the outcome. And so I'm happy that, that our court has come up with a way to give you some level of certainty, some, some way to get on an earlier flight, right? And maybe it's not perfect, but it is some level of certainty in the next 60 days where you don't have to have all your travel documents in order. You don't need your FSC docs, all your I's don't have to be dotted and your T's don't have to be crossed. Um, in, in, the, in the realm of things that can happen at that gate, right? I, I mentioned not having an MSC in the last 90 days, um, not having uh, the comfort or flexibility of waiting for those five day trailing period. Some other things that happen, for those of you who have been in my court, you know, I kind of uh, feel like a school mom. I have a three page trial checklist, but I have to go through all your trial docs. It's amazing all the things that go wrong and, I'm, and you know we're all doing our best but you know often those things are not conformed um, the tabs are not aligned or the columns you didn't put the right number of columns I don't know how many exhibits exactly or maybe they're not labeled appropriately in the exhibit binder there are a number of tiny little things that can happen um, so so it is uncertain at best and I, what I want to convey to you is in my court um, it is possible that maybe a reservation opens up before the end of the year but even then, that is going to get filled with somebody who's been waiting longer, uh, a trial from 2018, cases from 2016 that were filed in 2016, 2017. I try to fill those spots this year with those cases from 2016 and 2017. If your case was filed in 2018, I try to fill you in 2022. If your case was filed in 2019, you're looking at 2023. Um, that's not exactly true for all courts. I know in some of my colleagues' courts, the next trial date might be 2022 even for a 2019 case. But I guess what I'm trying to explain to you is it's uncertain. And uh, I don't like being the, the airline attendant who is trying to explain to you that there is no 
recent flight. So I, I'm grateful for this program because it does offer a certain level of certainty. It offers you a way to uh, release that anxiety uh, waiting for the trial date. Um, you don't have to submit all your FSC docs. All you have to do is file that document. Um, and so hopefully this can give you a little bit of uh, finite uh, expectations um, in, in this world as a COVID. But I wanted to give you a glimpse of what things look like in my corner of the world. So I hope to the extent that that's helpful, I hope that maybe you can take something from that. Thank you for hearing from me. Thanks so much for that great information, Judge Mario. We really appreciate it from the perspective of the PI Hub. And that was incredibly useful information. Um, the next four judges that we are going to hear from are all trial court judges, which means they would be the ones that would actually try these cases in the expedited fast track PI bench trial program. And the first judge we are going to hear from is Judge Stephen Maloney. Uh, he's won awards from both the plaintiff and defense bars. He spent 34 years at Gilbert Kelly with deep civil experience. He was the president of ASCDC and became a member of ABOTA. Judge Maloney is in the Moss Courthouse. And believe it or not, this is actually the second time as a judge that he has worn a robe. Uh, the first was in the late 1960s at seminary where he wore a cassock with everyone else. You don't see that much anymore except at the Vatican. And he's perhaps the only person I have ever known that has worn a robe in two different professions. Judge Maloney. Thank you, Doug. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, why, why this program? Why this program? I think it's simple why this program. There are as many as 65,000 personal injury cases pending, 65,000. Ask yourself as you sit here this afternoon participating in this presentation, what if anything is holding you back from embracing this pilot program for just a few of your cases to give it a try? If you have cases that would fit into the program, I would ask you to give the court the chance to show it can work with you and your client. So what can you do? S try to select five cases that might benefit by not being delayed for a year or two. Just think about those words. Find a couple of cases, five I'd say, that could benefit from this program. Go over these cases with your client, if you're the plaintiff, or with the insurer, if it's for the defense. Try to work out high lows. They can benefit both sides. Consider cases where liability is admitted. All you have to do is try damages. You'd only have to call maybe one expert, possibly at most two. Then a statement of decision will come as a result of the case. The trial judge will prepare a statement of decision, but you can follow the Casey verdict form and then comment further on the issues as they apply. Uh, substantial factor, burden of proof, credibility, but you'll get a statement of decision unless it's under eight hours, but I think most of the judges will give you a statement of decision. Consider auto, trip and fall, slip and fall cases as candidates for the program as you go through and I hopefully look and find five cases. Consider with your client's approval, allowing attorneys with less trial experience to try one of these cases with your client's approval. Give them a chance. Forget the age of the person, they may lack experience. Give them the chance to do it. Look at your caseload. After you leave here, you know, when your wheels up from the meeting, we used to say, if you haven't read the materials, wheels up on the plane, you'll never read them. Well, if you don't do this today or the next day, you won't do it. Look at your caseload. I'm pretty sure there are cases that are right for the program. You can uh, file motions in limine to preclude or exclude, exclude evidence, just like you do in the jury trial cases. So what do you do? Complete discovery, sign the stipulation. With Judge Cowan's agreement, you could be in trial in days. Finish discovery, sign the stipulation, you could be in trial in days. So let me conclude. As you evaluate, as you leave the meeting, talk to your associates and partners, whether to participate, as you decide whether to participate, remember that you could be up against 65,000 personal injury cases, plus asbestos preference cases, and potentially tens of thousands of UD preference cases. 
but you can go to trial in days or in max 60 days. I'd urge you to consider participating. There's no faster way to get to trial. I understand the business of personal injury plaintiff and defense law. As Doug said, I had 34 years and now 12 years on the court. I understand what a personal injury practice is from plaintiff or defense, but I think those members of the bar who practice in that area can find some cases and can make this work. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Judge Maloney. We really appreciate all your experience in this area and your comments. All right, our next trial judge that we're going to hear from is Judge Margie Oldendorf. Uh, known for her patience and reaching the right ruling, Judge Oldendorf has presided over many significant personal injury trials, has won numerous awards, has deep civil experience as an attorney, and she's in the Pasadena courthouse. Interestingly, before embarking on a legal career, she worked at Disneyland and once sold Mickey Mouse balloons to Ringo Starr of the Beatles. She's also famous for being a cowboy lawyer, and you can see her riding horses when she's not on the bench. Judge Oldendorf. Doug, thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for participating in this program. Uh, one of the messages uh, that I would like to impart uh, in my brief comments is uh, to follow up on Judge Cowan and Judge Maloney and Judge Morillo uh, is um, we have been doing these court trials pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. We are capable of doing them uh, and we have been doing them. To illustrate, I wanted to highlight just a couple of cases that, that I've heard uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I had uh, in this past year during COVID a, uh, a preference uh, medical malpractice case. Um, it was a 12 day trial. We had 16 witnesses. Four of those witnesses testified remotely by Zoom. Two were deposition testimony read into the record. The other 10 were live witnesses. There was a statement of decision. Uh, this particular case uh, resulted in a, um, a defense uh, judgment. Another case that I had uh, just immediately before the pandemic uh, was a uh, personal injury case involving a serious injury, auto versus pedestrian. That case was also 12, 12 trial days. We had over 20 witnesses in that case. There were 27 motions in limine. Um, there was a statement of decision in that case. That particular case resulted in a judgment for the plaintiff. Um, so we can do these cases. I think that some points that I would make as you consider whether to select a particular case for a bench trial is to, um, uh, to tell you that we are able to handle remote testimony. Um, we can do it. One of the things that really helped a lot in the cases that I have heard thus far is to have counsel get professional technical support, whether that is in-house or from an outside vendor. It was just instrumental in our ability to have these cases presented in an efficient uh, and um, effective way. Another thing that I felt was really essential is it's critical for counsel to be able to work together to present the case. On the cases where we had remote testimony, for example, uh, the attorneys had uh, met and conferred ahead of time and they were able to work things out to make it a very, very smooth process. So uh, we are able to handle these cases and um, you should uh, not hesitate, I don't think, for us to, uh, to be able to, to try these in a, in a fair and appropriate manner for you. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so much, Judge Oldendorf. All right, our next trial judge that we will hear from is Judge Michelle Fleur. Uh, and in what is becoming a common theme here, uh, she worked as a civil attorney, both in law firms and as a general counsel 
prior to becoming a, a commissioner and then after being appointed as a judge, she has served since 2006 in a judicial capacity. Uh, she's in the Long Beach courthouse. And in addition to her sharp legal mind, she is as comfortable fencing with a saber as she is building a fence. Judge Fleur. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I mirror a lot of the statements that my colleagues have uh, made. Uh, I'm going to use my time uh, to sort of chart out the options that you have that you might want to consider with your uh, clients. And let me pull up the chart and share it. So obviously the first option is to settle the whole case. And either if you get through the settlement program with the court or the virtual uh, settlement program, there'll be no trial, of course. Uh, option two and three and four, or what we're talking about today is waiving a jury. You should consider uh, whether you wanna add a high low to that. Uh, just a note of caution, make sure you provide for comparative fault and the effect on your high low agreement. Um, also consider costs, how they will be affected, who will be the prevailing party in your high-low agreement. Um, another thing to note is that some high-low agreements um, might need approval, especially if you're uh, in a case involving a minor. Um, the next step would be whether you want a remote trial. So you've waived the jury, uh, you've either entered into a high-low agreement, uh, should you have all of the trial remote, part of the trial? Maybe you just are in court for opening and closing. Um, it allows great flexibility because instead of having your expert come to court and charge you an entire half day, you can give them a specific hour uh, to testify, um, hopefully reducing the cost for, uh, for you and for opposing counsel. Um, option three is to settle damages only and try liability. Um, I've done this in a jury trial where the parties were able to settle the damages, but let, left to the jury, in this case, you'll be leaving it to the judge, liability. Um, it greatly reduces the cost. No medical experts needed, uh, no pain and suffering witnesses, no fellow employees testifying about the plaintiff. Um, no employee test or no plaintiff testimony. All of the witnesses will talk only about liability. Again, you still have to consider whether it's going to be a remote trial or not. The fourth option uh, is of course to waive the jury, add a high low and then uh, settle liability. So you would only be trying damages. Uh, again, you have to consider whether you're gonna do a remote trial or not, um, but also, uh, consider that even though you, you might settle liability, you could also settle liability um, and divide the comparative fault. So it doesn't have to be 100%. Maybe the other side would agree if it was a 60-40 split or a 75-25 split. And then just having the judge decide what the damages are, and then you would apply your agreement uh, to that amount. Uh, finally, if you're unable to waive the jury uh, and you haven't settled the case, I would like you to consider to stipulate to a smaller jury. Um, because of social distancing that we are still using in the courtroom, the jurors are all around the courtroom, which means they are behind you. Uh, if you stipulate to a smaller uh, group, um, you could have them on one side of the courtroom, which I think aids a lot. You can also, at least in my court, um, I'm willing to talk about uh, allowing you to have the same number of peremptories, but for a smaller group. So instead of um, six peremptories for 12, having six peremptories for eight jurors. Again, our focus here though, is to have a court trial and to uh, reduce um, having jurors uh, and getting you to trial as soon as possible. So let me up sharing here and uh, thank you Doug. Thank you so much for that Judge Fleur. We really appreciate it. like the chart too. nice graphics. It really does lay out all the flexibility of this program and all the different options that, that there are. Our next trial judge uh, that we're going to hear be hearing from is Judge Fred Schaller. Um, 
Judge Schaller has over 40 years experience as a civil attorney and judge and is an ABOTA member. He is well known for his excellent judicial demeanor. And I had the privilege with working him, with him on an evidence program almost 10 years ago. Uh, Judge Schaller is in the Spring Street Courthouse. And we'll turn it over to you now. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, well, it's uh, I want to focus after hearing all of these other comments uh, on really the practicalities and the benefits of this program. Uh, I was a trial lawyer all those years, and the worst thing that could happen is that I got my witnesses marshaled and my evidence together in the books and marched down to court with a big um, box uh, of evidence and found out my case was continued three months and then another three months and another three months. I think the brilliance of this program uh, that Judge Cowan has uh, come up with is the date certain aspect of this. And you can get ready for your trial. You know your trial is going to get the priority uh, that you would like it to have and need it to have. And that you can then uh, proceed with getting the file closed. Now, whether I was in a defense firm or a plaintiff's firm, uh, the mantra always was get that trial completed, get the case closed, settlement or trial. And then you can move on to the next. Uh, having a trial hanging over your head for months and years, especially one now that, you know, this was under the best of times. And in the current environment, I mean, this is going to go on forever, literally, uh, possibly. Uh, getting uh, these cases to trial will give you the opportunity to move on to handle the other cases that possibly are better cases for a jury trial. Um, in some ways, I think that uh, the smaller cases, the problem cases, uh, the, the cases that uh, have really strong legal issues as are going to take a lot of uh, judicial time to resolve, cases with uh, messy emotions in limine where you might end up having felony convictions admitted or alcohol consumption admitted or, or things uh, of that nature, um, I really think that it is a fantastic opportunity to try this before a judge where you can get uh, your evidence presented in a way where the judge can exercise his second hat, the first hat being the, the judge that admits the evidence, the other judge, uh, the other hat being the one where he decides a case where he can filter that evidence and make a, a decision based on experience and a lot of times in equity uh, to come up with the right decision. And so, I mean, I really uh, feel that this is a great opportunity uh, for people to break the habit of thinking that all I have to do is, <laughs> all I can do, I should say, is to, to have a, a jury trial, to think that a lot of cases can be resolved uh, with the help of a judge who's got experience. And I think that in the in the PI panel of uh, judges, uh, all of the judges have such great experience that I think you're in good hands and you should not, uh, uh, I think, fear what might happen uh, before a judge. And I think, uh, hearkening back to my days as a trial lawyer, I, I mean, uh, how many times has a jury uh, evaded my uh, ability to figure out what they're likely to do? I think we're more of a known entity and that we would be a, a safer home for you to try your case. So I think in a lot of cases that may not be true, maybe the huge cases, but in certainly in the smaller cases, uh, less fact intensive cases, more law intensive cases, that would be the best home. Anyway, thank you. I'll send it back. Thanks so much, Judge Shal. So I really appreciate your perspective uh, from all your time as a practicing uh, attorney in the personal injury realm before you came on the bench and then all your experience on the bench. So we've now just heard from uh, four trial judges in the court. These are the judges that would actually hear the cases in this program. Um, it's all the trial judges uh, that would be available to hear this. Uh, and we're going to make a slight turn now and we're going to hear from attorneys uh, who are well, well respected in the Los Angeles legal community uh, from the various organizations that are supporting this program, why this program makes so much sense for the appropriate case. And the first one we're going to hear from is Sean McCann. Sean is here representing ABOTA. 
Uh, he is an extremely experienced trial attorney specializing in personal injury cases at BDJ Law, where he is a partner. He's known for his civility and being an all round great guy who I have known for almost 20 years. He's an avid skier with his wife and four kids. And I just learned that they got a Rhodesian, Rhodesian Ridgeback puppy this weekend, and her name is Roxy. Sean? Hey, thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, the big news in our house right now is the puppy, and I, I really can't get past that, and I've forgotten everything else I was going to say. Uh, I'm here on behalf of a Buddha. I'm a plaintiff's lawyer, uh, but... I'm here on behalf of an organization that represents both plaintiffs and defense attorneys. And our primary goal in ABODA is civility and secondarily to protect the Seventh Amendment, the civil uh, jury trial. And so you wonder why I am speaking on behalf of the bench trial program. Uh, I'm on the executive committee and we got this request to review the program and have our input and we wrestled with it a little bit, uh, but we found it to be a really great alternative to what we really, really support in the jury system. We have an unprecedented backlog of cases, and now this is an unprecedented move to open up what I see as a new lane. We're all on the 405, we're all in jammed in traffic, all the cars are stopped and pretty much the freeway is shut. Very few cars are getting by and they're opening up a new lane. That's the way I see this. It doesn't work for everybody, but there are a lot of cases that I think it will work for. Um, plaintiff or defense, we were all hired with one goal in mind. Our clients come to us to help them resolve a dispute. A jury trial is a great way to do it. A bench trial is also a great way to do it. We all have cases in our firm that need to get closed out. We just know that. Um, not all the cases are gonna be perfect for this, but as a plaintiff's lawyer, I will admit, I have some clients who may not be jury likable. They're good people. Everyone's deserving of justice, plaintiff or defense. But plaintiff or defense, we probably have clients that we wanna hide from the jury as much as we can. And a judge with his or her training and experience is gonna be more likely to be a fair renderer of a verdict and justice despite the blemishes our clients may have. Uh, so I am looking at my cases. I've got a case that should settle, except for there's one issue of who ran the red light. The damages are out there, they're pretty agreed upon, but the defense and the plaintiff can't decide who ran the red light. And so this is the case I'm gonna try and get before a judge. Help us decide that issue. If we can decide that issue, settlement's probably gonna come really close. Or maybe we do a high-low, give them our life care plans, our economists. No one needs to take the time and money to do that in front of a judge and get this case resolved. Win or lose, you know, at least there's going to be justice. Um, you know, I'm going to give up my, the rest of my time. I have a couple minutes, but I just want to say, give it some thought. Go through your cases. There's more flexibility. It could be cheaper and it can be sooner. We're all here to solve and resolve disputes. And when we put on that hat and consider this, I think we're gonna find something that really helps our clients. Thank you, Doug. Thanks so much, Sean. Very, very well said. And so as we move from ABODA, we're now going to hear from Diana Lytell from ASCDC. Uh, she is a partner at Lothorpe Richards, where she specializes in the defense of premises liability and commercial litigation matters. She's on the ASCDC board, and it's been a privilege getting to know her as part of this program. I've, all, I've learned that she is an avid scuba diver and has done dives all over the world, including the famous wall in Cozumel, where she dove to a depth of 200 feet. Diana? Thank you, Doug. I can also add dovetailing on uh, Judge Oldendorp that I also back in the day did work at Disneyland. So we are Disney partners there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Diana Lytell. I am the current president of ASCDC. And I just want to say thank you to everyone involved in putting this program together for inviting us to the table so that we can give a defense perspective 
throughout all of this, the plaintiff and defense bars have really worked collaboratively together to come up with some real solutions to the COVID-19 backlog. Um, I also wanna say thank you to LASC court leadership, in particular, Judge Taylor and Judge Cowan, who have really spearheaded programs like this and are coming up with unique solutions to really complex problems. We've all been working collaboratively together. It's really commendable. Um, and you know, we're all in this together to get our cases moving forward. So, uh, you know, why this program? Why do I like it? Number one, it's really about the flexibility. The parties can really stipulate to so many different options and create the bench trial that you want. Um, also, as many others have touched on, the cost effectiveness of this. Often jury trials are incredibly expensive unpredictable. Here you're getting predictability as to what your costs are going to be. Um, you know, the high lows, a, a few people have touched on those as well. From a defense perspective, from a carrier perspective, that's huge for us because you're going into a case where potentially you, you have some idea of what the outcome is going to be, what those damages are going to be. And from for a carrier, that's big. Um, you know, if you can stipulate to those kinds of things, that really helps. We all really need to do our part. Um, as the judges have touched on, there's 65,000 cases right now. Um, and we need to all collaboratively come together and do our part um, and, and try to get these cases moving through. And this program for the right case really makes a lot of sense to help alleviate that backlog. So you know, I encourage everybody look through your, your case list um, and find that right case to, to test this out. It really is a great program. And again, that, that big thing for me is that flexibility and really allowing part, parties to uh, create the, the trial that you want, the bench trial that you want. Um, so with that, um, I will hand it back to Doug. Um, I don't know, I probably have some time left uh, and go on to our next speaker. Thanks so much, Diana. And I'm sure we'll utilize that time and put it to good use during the Q&A session. Really, really appreciate your comments. Thank you. And uh, and so uh, batting cleanup here on the attorney portion uh, and all the support across both sides of the aisle for this program is Min Nguyen. Min is here representing Cala and he will serve as Cala's president in 2023. He's also a past president of the Los Angeles Trial Lawyers Charities, doing a lot of great work in the community. Uh, he specializes in PA, PI cases at his own firm, and he's really one of the good guys in the practice of law, and I've been proud to call him a friend for 15 years. Uh, Min is not only an Ironman in the courtroom, he's actually completed the Ironman race twice, where he swam 2.4 miles, then biked 112 miles, and then ran a marathon. I'm tired just saying that. Min? Thanks, Doug. Well, thanks for that kind introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm here on behalf of the Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles, CALA, uh, the plaintiff's bar in LA. And first, let me start off by saying thank you to all the bench leader, well, Judge Taylor, Judge Cowan, and all the other judges who have put this program together. Um, and Because let's face facts, without a trial, um, as a plaintiff lawyer, it's hard to settle cases. Carriers are not paying what they should be paying. Um, and they're using the, the pandemic, the lack of trials to, um, you know, hang on to their money and, and rightfully so, because they're a business enterprise and their the return in the market is fantastic for them. Um, so I want to thank the, the, uh, the bench, uh, for putting the program together. Also thank ABOTA, uh, ASCDC and, uh, the LA County Bar Association for putting this program on. So why a bench trial? As I said, as we all know, uh, nothing settles a case like a, a trial, uh, be it a jury trial or a bench trial. Um, and I, I take some exceptions with the thought that uh, only low value cases should be tried to a bench. I, I, I frankly disagree with that. I think there are cases that are ripe for a bench trial, even if it's a seven or eight figure case. And I personally have agreed to a bench trial uh, for a number of reasons on cases that I value in the seven and eight figures range because I, I trust the bench. I truly do. Uh, judges, 
um, have the legal training. Uh, they know they've seen verdicts. They know people are watching. They know where the verdict should be. And as long as you're not asking uh, outrageous sum of money and you have the evidence to support it, if you have a huge life care plan, if you have a, a huge loss of earnings, a, a, a judge may give it to you and will most likely give it to you, particularly if you have cases that involve difficult liability. Um, so look at your inventory um, and look at trying these cases. Um, otherwise, you know, if you wait for a jury trial, you may have to wait a year, 18 months from now. Um, it takes a while. And as a plaintiff lawyer, when we have to carry those costs uh, for our client, it's, it's difficult. And nothing is more satisfying when you do, you give up your weekend to prepare a case for trial and you actually get out and get a, a, get a trial. Uh, nothing sucks more when you have to prepare for trial two, three, four, five times. Um, not only do you spend your time on the weekend, but your experts, uh, you know, they work up a file. They either work for free and they charge you. And that, that's costly. So look at your cases. Um, and I think this is a wonderful program because um, we all have cases. And I think this program is also great for seasoned trial lawyers and also uh, up and coming uh, rising stars and young associates who want to try cases. Um, you know, um, we always make a big push about uh, giving young lawyers an opportunity to try cases. Uh, well, a, a bench trial is a, is a trial. It's a good experience. Uh, Cross-examining witnesses is still the same. Um, in fact, I finished a trial. I got a verdict last Monday for a case I tried in Long Beach. Um, and one of the best part of that trial was to have my expert testify and using teams. You know, nothing stressed out a trial lawyer more than running out of witnesses and knowing that uh, the courts are allowing experts and witnesses to zoom in from their desk or from the home to testify on a minute's notice. It takes off the, it takes the pressure off. Um, so anyways, um, that's, that's my perspective uh, on bench trials. Uh, CALA supports bench trials. Always, obviously not all cases are suitable, but as a lawyer, you know which case is suitable. Talk to the defense, uh, see if they will agree to it. Uh, it. Makes life a lot easier. And who knows by having a jury trial or bench trial uh, set, uh, the carrier may come around and, and get the case resolved. Okay. Um, so anyways, I want to save the rest of the, my time for Q and A because there should be a lot of questions about this program, and I want to hear more from the judges because I have questions for the judges as well. Even though uh, Cal has been involved in this program and supports it, uh, so Doug, so thank you. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate that. So now we're going to be tra uh, transitioning to the Q and A uh, part of the program. I just want to remind everyone before we start that uh, in the Zoom webinar function, uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen that you can ask a question that all of the panelists on today's program will be able to see. And I'll be acting as the moderator for these questions, um, but I do encourage you, um, th there are lots and lots of different issues applicable to this. Uh, so please, please do that. We already have some questions. Um, and at this time, what I would like to do is invite uh, all of our judge and attorney panelists to unmute their mics and to turn on their camera and join uh, the program for the Q&A okay. session. Okay. okay, fantastic. Looks like we have Looks everyone like have on everyone. right now. I'm getting just a little bit of feedback. So why don't we do this? Why don't we mute uh, our microphones until each one of us speaks. And that way we can uh, make sure there's not any feedback for the presentation. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, you may have noticed there was some chatting going on that Judge Fleur has graciously agreed to share her options chart. Um, we will either have that emailed to each of today's attendees uh, through their registration, or we will make it available through CALA, LACPA, or SoCal Defense. So we will get that out. So Judge Fleur, we really appreciate that. Uh, the chart does very nicely lay out the various different options and highlight the flexibility and advantages 
of this program. Um, let me start with uh, a question that we received. There are some newer attorneys uh, on this call, and I guess we presume that everyone that's been doing this uh, knows what a high-low is, but someone asked exactly what that is. Um, so I would like to ask, uh, perhaps one of you uh, can uh, briefly explain what a high-low is. Well, if no one else jumped in, uh, uh, I've done high lows and, and trials where when you get generally to the end of a trial, uh, the plaintiff and the defense come together generally in the hallway of the courthouse or over a, uh, a beverage at night as they congratulate each other and get nervous about the verdict and agree on a floor to the verdict and a ceiling for the verdict. So it, making up numbers here, if the plaintiff asks for you know, a million dollars in a verdict, they may agree that the verdict, no matter what happens, the defense only has to pay 750,000. And no matter what happens, defense verdict or low verdict, the defense will pay say 250,000. So you create a high and a low. These are the floor and the ceiling for what the verdict is. Generally as part of this, you come to an agreement with respect to costs. Is it one side gonna pay cost over a certain value? or does both sides waive costs? In my experience, most of the time, both sides waive costs. And then you both agree that there'll be no appeal of the verdict. Uh, and often that there'll be no judgment entered or a judgment will be entered at the amount of verdict if it's between the high and the low or for the high or the low. Uh, and so what it does is it provides some certainty to the parties, an insurance carrier or a corporate defendant will know their maximum exposure. And the plaintiff will often know, no matter what happens, they'll be able to assure their client they get a, a certain amount of money, um, usually enough to make sure you pay the fees, costs, medical bills, and get money into the pocket of your client. It also provides the assurity that the plaintiff or the defense won't have to pay costs in the end. Some of our clients get nervous about a defense verdict and having to be on the hook for cost to the defense. This is generally taken care of in an agreement. And I don't want to talk too much on this, but you put this on the record. I would advise that on the record in front of the court uh, to make sure it is enforceable and uh, that it, it's all captured and there's no discrepancies. Thank you. David, go ahead. I agree that it's important to memorialize the agreement. But you could also, as a, a one variant on that, choose to keep the agreement confidential from the judge so that he or she can um, um, do what they have to do and, um, uh, and then come back and have that agreement uh, regardless of what, what, how it came in. I apologize. I was talking about a, ver a jury case and that shouldn't probably be applicable here. I would assume that you could do it in writing and may get it on the record in another courtroom uh, if that would be available. I've done it in another courtroom when we had a bench trial um, and some other judge gets to hear what you settled the case for, even if he or she doesn't know what the case was about. Great, thanks for that input. Um, we've also got a question about how 170.6s work with this program. What would be the deadline to file? Would it just simply be if a party still has their 170.6 and they are assigned to a judge that they would retain that right as they would in any other situation? Yes, uh, uh, the, the, accept, the acceptance form will give both sides the, um, uh, the specific time um, when that would be, be responsive um, and um, uh, so that you'd know promptly um, and beforehand when you have to get that back to us. We have another question. Uh, it's, it's somewhat of a procedural matter, but it affects the case. How are offers to compromise affected, if at all, by this fast track program? Essentially asking a question about 998s. Uh, I don't I defer to others more experienced with those, but I would just say that frankly, that hasn't come up to date. Um, but I think that um, a trial is a trial. So uh, I don't really um, see at this juncture, at least, I don't want to give any legal opinions 
uh, but um, um, uh, again, I don't, I don't. There's not, there's nothing intended here in this program to vary the rules that would otherwise apply. Um, Doug, I'll answer that question. I think the judges have assured us that this program does not affect uh, 998s or offers to compromise. So Ed Piley, who asked, who asked that question. Um, the rules are the same. If you uh, obtain a more favorable verdict or bench a ruling than the 998, then you get to apply for your 998 costs. And just like uh, uh, under the, the normal rules or a bench trial or jury trial, this program does not affect that. Doug, this is Steve Maloney. I, I, I agree. Um, you have arbitration where 998s apply and it's no different. Non-jury trial, it's a it's an arbitration, and the same thing here with a with a uh, court trial. So I, I don't think it makes any difference. It's very possibly enforceable. I won't comment further beyond that. So it seems to be the consensus that nine nine eights simply exist as they normally would with any type of trial, jury, bench, or otherwise. All right, uh, this is an interesting question. Um, we have a case in Lancaster, a PI case there, that's been set for jury trial numerous times. Their question is, under the expedited bench trial program, could the case stay in Lancaster as that would be important for the parties and the witnesses and experts to remain locally there as that would help with time and expense both for the court and the parties? I'll take, take this initial stab at that and um... As I said in my introduction, uh, the form does have a place at the bottom for um, special uh, considerations. I'm very mindful that um, uh, North District cases in Lancaster um, are many, many miles away from, for example, downtown Los Angeles. While I can't provide specific assurance on a particular case, obviously, uh, I can tell you whether if you've got, whether you're in Lancaster or if you're in Pomona, it makes sense and the judge is available to keep it locally there. I, of course, would would do that just as I would assigning any case that comes through Department 1. We're always very mindful of geography uh, and particular Lancaster is we always try to do, um, get, provide special accommodation to that court because of that court house rather because of its distance from other parts of the county. So. Um, speaking generally, I think that people should feel confident if there's somebody available again, which is sometimes not always the case, that we would, um, those kinds of considerations would definitely uh, be taken, taken into, uh, into account. All right, thanks for that, David. I mean, you are hearing directly from the Department One judge on this issue, so this is fantastic information. All right, the next question is uh, that uh, for jury trials, uh, there has to be a mediation or settlement conference uh, within 90 days uh, prior to being able to go out for the jury trial. Is there a similar requirement for the program being discussed today? I like questions where I can give one word answers. The answer is no. Uh, there is no such requirement. Uh, and the, the, the 90 day rule that uh, Department One imposed um, uh, given the pandemic earlier this year uh, applies only to jury trials uh, and not to bench trials. So um, if you're ready, you say you're ready on that form, I'm going to take you at your word. Uh, our trial judges will do the same and we will line it up. Uh, that's the plan. This is expedited. I like expedited. It's, you know, we're moving. So I want to keep that, keep that's the spirit of this. We're not going to give, create additional settlement hurdles. You know, I would of course hope that in all cases, people have tried to resolve their cases short of any kind of trial, but we're not going to um, slow this down once we've got once we got we got the, the ball rolling. Great, thank you for that, David. All right, I'd like to now kind of uh, open it up for an even greater panel discussion and get input uh, on what might be the kinds of cases that council would want to seriously consider for a program like this. I know um, we've had, I think it was Sean that may have mentioned uh, if a client maybe lacks jury appeal, but you know, are we talking about stipulated liability or cases with varied level, varying levels of damages, uh, maybe a heavy on the law case 
or governmental or design immunity issues. Um, I, I'd like to hear from, from the judges and attorneys the types of cases that they think would be particularly well suited to this. Go ahead, Mark. This is just one example, but uh, all the considerations you just mentioned, I might, I think, might be um, cases where uh, a bench trial might be a good idea. Uh, I had a case where the defendant was no longer an employee of the de other defendant entity. She was out of state. She was not going to be physically present in court. And so she testified by a videotape deposition. In a jury trial, a jury might have a feeling about a party not being physically present in the courtroom. And so in a bench trial, I think a judge is more accustomed to things like that, maybe less likely to have um, uh, you know, a negative impact on your case. That's just one example. That's a great example, uh, David. I don't mean to, to keep up to, to stop this discussion about the appropriate case, but before I forget, I think one thing I'd really like to emphasize that we haven't emphasized so far is, and it kind of follows up on the last question you asked me about geography, which is that one huge benefit, I would argue, for these, these kind of trials is that you can agree that they can be done remotely. So that whether you're in Lancaster, Pomona, Long Beach, frankly, it shouldn't matter where the judge happens to be, have his or her chambers or courtroom. Uh, and so um, uh, this could all be entirely remote. Uh, and um, you have to, you have to, I have to bet that there's a number of cases out there where um, that's going to be advantageous. And I did a couple of these uh, remote bench trials myself last year. And the lawyers loved it. I liked it. It was so, everything was up on the screen. Um, these, these were complicated seven figure contract cases. Um, and um, um, it went out, they went like a hitch, without a hitch rather, like, sorry. But um, the, uh, the remote aspects of doing bench trials cannot be underestimated. It's, 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 it's really, people pared down the presentations um, and um, we could see one another. The examinations of direct and cross were effective. Um, and um, I think that I think the lawyers were very, you know, very pleased with the way it, way it presented. Of course, one side didn't like my decision, but you know, what, what's new? Is there an option for it to be a hybrid program where some of it is in person and some of it is remote? I would leave that to each judge in his or her you know, discretion and, and for the parties. But I think, as, as many of you have already commented, the flexibility here, I think uh, Diane, Diana was pointing that out in particular. Uh, that's, that's, that's a big, a big option. I think it's very much on the table. Judge Fleur, I saw you nodding your head up and down uh, in a yes uh, response to whether you could have it hybrid. Can you give us some thoughts about the flexibility that you might offer in your courtroom to parties about either being in-person, remote, or some combination of the two? Absolutely. Um, so if you wanted to come in, you could do opening, you could do closing. Um, you could be there the whole time if you wanted, and we just put the witnesses up on the, the big screen. Although, um, I. I, we can be as flexible as the parties want to be flexible. So completely remote or completely in person, uh, as long as it's just a bench trial, there's not going to be that many people in the courtroom. So I, I think we're all very flexible and we're, we're all have done um, virtual MSCs already. And we're, you know, experts now at uh, Zoom and um, uh, LA Court Connect <laughs> and Teams. So I, I think it's pretty easy. The Long Beach Courthouse is particularly set up well for technology. So we don't, we don't have any issues there. Do you want to add something, David? Yeah, just briefly on, on the technology um, front, the, um, some of you probably were not in th that enthused by LACC in the early months 
uh, and you were happy to be able to contact, have contact with the court, but the video left something to be desired. So the world has changed. We, and we now have teams at the court uh, and it, everybody tells me it, it is another world. And so of course, having a trial remotely, you wanna have the predictability that it's gonna go smoothly. And you really do have it with teams. The couple bench trials I mentioned earlier, the lawyers pr provided their own platforms. And I, all I had to do was press, press, a, uh, press the, uh, on the link and it was all there for me. So whether you choose to use your own platform or you can have the team's link through the court and LACC, um, that aspect of the reliability is, is there for you. And uh, I, I've had the opportunity now to have several proceedings on the new uh, Teams platform, and it is a substantial improvement. It is important to download the app on your computer uh, and not do it through a web-based solution. It, it does function much better through the app. Uh, and when we hear, you know, attorneys supplying their own platform, um, that sounds sort of like, you know, oh, that sounds very technical. Well, it's as simple as sending someone a Zoom link. And that's, that's what I think Judge Cowan was talking about uh, when he joined uh, those, those trials. Um, you know, we think about motions in limine typically in a jury setting, but it might be important even in a bench trial. It could narrow the focus of the case. Uh, there might be some evidence that would be an undue consumption of time or is really not relevant to the disposition of the case uh, that one party, you know, wants to put forward and the other opposes. I was wondering if some of the judges, you know, obviously the judge is both the trier of fact uh, and the gatekeeper in a bench trial, but I'd like to hear from some of the judges uh, perhaps Judge Maloney or Judge Schaller on the issue of addressing motions in limine in these cases. All right, well, I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> well, from the way I perceive what's going to happen is that it's going to be um, just like we have with the jury trial. We have a pretrial conference and we go through the uh, motions in limine. I, I think it's an indispensable part even <clears throat> of a non-jury trial because it gets me as a trier of fact up to speed as to what are the issues that are going to be coming in. I mean, this is a cold case when we can, when we get it. Pre-trial conference gives us the opportunity and really on the motions in limine gives us a great opportunity to get our feet wet on the case. So I, I see it happening just like uh, in a jury trial, except in an abbreviated form, because a lot of the things are going to be fact specific and tentative rulings, but at least we kind of understand what, what's coming our way. I agree with Fred. Uh, the, the the idea is uh, um, usually the pe people will come in and say, I want to exclude or preclude the testimony of an expert or limit the testimony of an expert uh, because of uh, uh, the fact that they didn't cover something completely at deposition. I just had a non-jury trial that I was working on a statement of decision this morning where we uh, had autopsy photos. It was a non-jury trial, but there was a motion to exclude the autopsy photos. Um, they ultimately came in in the non-jury trial. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I agree, the idea is that you can ask the lawyers in a non-jury trial, what are the important motions at limine? Give me the two or three that really make the difference. It, it may be the reason they didn't settle because they weren't sure whether evidence was gonna come in or not. So I think they're useful. I, I don't wanna get 35 of them like you get in some cases, but uh, uh, no, I think they're helpful. Judge Fleur, I couldn't tell. Did you want to weigh in on that? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, add to Judge what Judge Maloney said. Once we go through the, the motions in limine, uh, it may be that we, um, if the parties stipulate, we talk settlement. So it's an opportunity to, um, it, there, we have a new court form, civil uh, form 287. Um, that if the parties stipulate, we can then talk settlement. I, I think after a discussion of the uh, and rulings on motions in limine is a, of a perfect time to explore it once more. I'm going to give it no case that goes to Judge Flora comes ever comes back after it goes to a metal for a settlement conference. She has I don't, I don't keep tabs on everybody, but she you know, I want to give her a public shout out for all, all the hard work and success in resolving uh, cases. Thank you. Well, it, 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 go ahead. Let, me, let me comment on something. Um, I, know, I know some plant floors are thinking out there and say, you know, 
courts are opening up. I'm just going to wait for a jury trial. Um, but let me just, having just tried a mask jury trial in Long Beach, even without the technology, if you can't see jurors' faces and you're trying to ask them questions and we'll do voir dire and you have them sit in the back, it is weird. It is tough to try those cases. Um, and so I think, you know, I got a verdict, but quite frankly, I think I would have done better had a bench trial. Um, and, you know, I know I will never know the answer, uh, but I think the idea of having a bench trial with the wealth of knowledge from the judicial officer about what's the fair value of, of an injury is huge. Um, you know, before the pandemic, we, we like to do jury trial because jurors don't know the value. We could pick some crazy numbers and sometimes we get it. Most of the time we don't, but sometimes we do. But I think with post pandemic, with the mass until that issue is cleared up, um, having an officer, uh, you know, do a bench trial is fantastic. I mean, we've heard the crazy numbers sometimes from a judge as well, right? We all heard that verdict. I'm not going to repeat it here on this panel. But we heard about the eight-figure verdict from a, from a judicial officer tried by one of the most famous plaintiff lawyers there is. So, uh, but the value of that case, you listen to the injuries, it's worth eight figures. So if you have, don't, so I would just urge everybody, um, leave aside the value of a case and whether a judge is going to give you more or less than a jury. I think a judge is more apt to give get it right uh, than a jury. So sorry, but sorry to chime in because that had to be mentioned. And then uh, I know we talked about teams again. Uh, if you ha are not familiar with teams, the court has changed their technology. It's fantastic. It's a lot easier. Judge Cowan mentioned that early, but I can't, the last uh, trial, it was teams. My expert testified using team. Saved the headache, saved the expense. It came off great. Um, it, it works. Um, so, that, uh, so let me just leave it at that. So thank you, Doug. Thanks, man. Uh, Diana, let me ask you, uh, from the defense perspective, uh, what has been kind of the word on the street with respect to insurance carriers and adjusters' views of this type of procedure? The, the carrier perspective, adjusters, I mean, again, it really goes into that flexibility, that ability to really, what's important to the carriers is really having predictability of what's going to happen. Um, you know, on the jury trial front, you're, you know, you're looking at un uncontrollable costs. You don't know when you're going to go here. You're going to get a set date. Um, that's something that's a real plus from the defense perspective. Uh, you're prepped. You're ready for trial. You're not going to be spinning your wheels and prepping for a jury trial. Show up on the first day and find out you're not going to go here. Parties stipulate within 60 days. You are going to go. You're prepped. You're ready. Um, and, and the ability to really do a hybrid and do what the parties want to do, that flexibility, those options, um, you know, to do openings in person, but have your experts testify on teams, you know, all of those options um, are very attractive from the carrier's perspective. Um, it, you know, I know we've talked a lot about the high-low, um, you know, that's also a very attractive feature on this uh, and getting them to agree. And it really comes down to the type of case as well. You know, for me in particular, I represent a lot of banks, financial institutions, businesses, um, and some of the some of this stuff can be a little bit dry. It's not something you want to take to a jury because you're just going to lose them. It's it's boring. It's finance, um, so it's not something that you really need to try in front of a jury. So for cases like that that are going to be very technical as well, this can be a really great program because. The bench officers are well versed at, in the law and these types of cases and can really properly evaluate it. Whereas a jury, you may lose them on something like that. If it's overly technical and they just, you know, don't have a background in it or they just find it boring, um, you know, you could lose them and that could really hurt you. So it, in that in that way, this is also a, a really great program. And it's nice to have an option as well. I joked with Diana when we were preparing for this. Some of us judges like those boring cases too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those of I have a, a background in financial issues, you know, we love that stuff. So bring it on. So, really good stuff. Thanks for that, Diana. Um, 
you know, one of the things that has uh, really, I think, been an important feature of this program is even before the pandemic, I would show up for trial and oftentimes get continued and not not be ready. And, you know, you're trying to line up all your witnesses. This program really gives certainty where the chance of going out on a trial on your date, you know, the date that's actually set uh, has, has been up in the air. Uh, it's certainly getting more firm, but this this program gives you an actual date to prepare for, to let your witnesses know, and for both sides to show up ready to go for trial. And, and I think that's something that as practicing attorneys, we have not been accustomed to uh, over the past 18 months or so. Uh, go ahead, David. So uh, we're closing in on our last few minutes here and, and without changing the subject, I, uh, but on a related note, um, the LA Superior Court and all of uh, bar leaders, and all of these different organizations have not only been working on this program, but we've, all, we've also been working on getting back the, the MSC program that you all probably recall at Spring Street. And so if you like this webinar, come back next Monday for another webinar over lunch and hear about our new remote MSC program that's been designed again specifically for the PI hub courts in Los Angeles. And so in particular, ASCDC, CALA, Beverly Hills Bar Foundation have, uh, have spent a lot of time and money uh, putting together a virtual platform uh, to do MSCs. So in conjunction with this program, I think that we are really trying to do what we can to provide you and your clients with alternative ways to get access to justice more quickly. So, um, I, want, I, have to, I couldn't leave here today without a plug for uh, next Monday. So put that in your calendars, please, and come back so you can see not only me, but uh, a lot of others uh, talk about that program. Thanks, Doug. If parties stipulate to the fast track bench trial in the 60 days or so, or however long it takes uh, to be set for the bench trial, can they also sign up for the new virtual MSC program to potentially resolve their case I'm back next Monday and I'll tell you okay I think that's going to be a yes um, it, is, but, uh, it is a yes but I, I got to uh, tease out here all right uh, and and actually today is the first day that the new resolve law virtual MSC program is going live so it's a very exciting day for the court a lot of work has put it been put into this uh, it's, it's, you're going to hear all about that next week. And I'll, I'll definitely be here to hear all about that, um, next week. Um, one of the questions has also been that, you know, with an expedited bench trial, does that mean discovery has to be expedited or can parties completely finish the discovery that they need to, and then put themselves in this program to go to the bench trial on an expedited basis? That's actually an excellent question. Um, the, um, the answer to it is that you can wait uh, and finish up your discovery and then opt to use this program. That being said, this is a pilot uh, and has an expiration date. So don't assume that after November 1, it's still gonna be around. So you have to elect to use this program before November 1. Um, if it's very successful, I'm sure that Judge Taylor will consider extending it. If it's less successful and we are busy with jury trials, uh, he may elect not to uh, continue the, with the program, but to finish your discovery, determine what discovery really is critical, but take advantage of it while it's being offered because it may not, it's right now, it's just through November 1. One of the questions we've had, oh, I'm sorry, Sean, did you want to add something? Uh, Thanks, Doug. I was just going to say in my last comment, if we can't settle a case, there's usually one primary reason we can't, whether it is an evidentiary issue that can be solved with a motion to eliminate, a liability issue. Um, and if you go through your cases and try and figure out what that one issue is, you can probably find a way to get it before a judge in a bench trial such as this in 60 days and solve that impediment to settling the case. Uh, you know, some cases have to go to trial in front of a jury, but if there's just one issue that you can get in front of a judge to solve that issue, you can still get into the settlement phase uh, after that issue has been solved. That was all. 
and, and many cases have sort of that one key issue. And if it's resolved one way or the other, potentially through a motion in limine or, or some other issue during the trial, it may be very beneficial to the parties to have that addressed so that they can then focus on the other aspects of the case that would allow for settlement. Um, I would just say that, just remember what Judge Maria said. Think about those dates. That's what's compelling this, you know, bottom line. Is do you want to get you want to go forward now or do you want to wait till she can provide you a date? It's, it's it's I think that's really what this to me that's what this is about is getting your client's resolution now. And, and I think that's a perfect segue to circle back to you, Judge Maria. We we've mostly been hearing from trial attorneys on the plaintiff and the defense side and from trial judges. Let me circle back to you as a PI hub judge after hearing all this and participating in the program, what are your some of your final thoughts as we wrap up the program? My, my final thoughts just revolve around the, the themes that everybody's been talking about, which is personally having presided over trials and also been a trial lawyer myself, I, I think there's a great deal of value in certainty and flexibility. And I think doing a bench trial, I know everybody loves you know, having a jury trial and, and getting in those jurors and they love the chance of hitting that big settlement or that big verdict like uh, Min was talking about. But the reality is that's not most cases. And, and I think the certainty that you get by going through a bench trial and the predictability that you have with the scheduling, what happens when jurors get sick or witnesses get sick or people can't make it, um, it it's just, it's eliminated uh, with the bench trial. So I would say flexibility, predictability and certainty. Thank you for asking me that. Great. Any uh, other final comments uh, from our esteemed panelists uh, before we wrap the show? All right. Well, hearing none, um, I'd like to ask all of our panelists to stay on for a minute. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees with over 300 people registered today. We really appreciate it. We've gone for an hour and a half and we still have a very substantial number uh, logged on and listening to this. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of everyone, uh, on behalf of LACPA, CALA, ASCDC, ABOTA, and of course the Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, this has been an incredibly informative program. Uh, we have received, uh, I've already received several emails uh, during the program thanking all the attorneys and judges for giving of their time and sharing this information. Uh, to definitely uh, help everyone understand how to utilize this program. So with that, I would ask uh, Danielle from LACPA to take us off of the uh, live broadcast webinar and for the panelists to stay on.